Sunday, we're having Christmas in July. And so I put in a bullet that I want you to bring your Christmassy things. And so we're going to sing There's Power in the Blood, but to advertise Christmas in July, you'll wear the bunny and jingle bells. Jingle bells. We're not going to sing jingle bells. No. But you'll have jingle bells. you got to come over here. I want you right here. Look at home and say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, I gotta stay in your that's gotta stay on your head. <laughs> let's let's and be nice and you know bright with the bells here. Yeah. Okay? No, no, you can't hurt me. Would you be free from your burden of sin? And so that's, you know, we have a, a hymn saying we have a lot of fun uh, and, and a lot of joy. And uh, right now we have one more thing to do. And you're lucky, June. Why are you lucky? Because Lois and I didn't make it to the costume store to get a proper birthday hat. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, she says. So this year you've ducked the wearing of the official soon-to-be birthday hat. Happy, it's your birthday. We won't make you stand up at all because everyone can see the, the glow from your face. Right? It's, it's just emanating from there. Oh! And you too! Right? What, 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 what? I've got it here. I've got it here. Hang on here. I've got it here. It's good. Oh, yeah. You too! Laura! It's her birthday. I don't... And, and, and it's June's birthday. They're coming up tomorrow on the following day. And we'd like to sing happy birthday to them all. 
for today, and I thank you for everyone who's come here today. I ask a blessing upon their lives, Lord, and those that they love. Father, we're going to have a serious talk later on, uh, but before we do that, we just want to praise and worship you, Lord. And I ask you incline your ear to hear our worship, and that you listen for and wait for the, the prayers and the petitions and the requests that we're going to lift to you. And I know that you will hear them all, each and every one of them. I know they will be a sweet incense uh, to you, Lord. May we glorify your name today with what we say and what we do and how we think, how we act and how we react, Lord. Father, may we just not only love you, but love each other in this place. So lead us, Holy Spirit, lead us today in this service we ask. In the precious name of Yeshua, amen. Amen. Down at the cross is where my Savior died. Down where we cleanse and come sin I cry. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name and glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. Yeah. 
God this morning. And each and every one of you can experience the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. But we need to open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receive what the Holy Spirit wants for you. The messages He wants to give to you. The way that He wants to guide and lead you. And so if you have a, a if there's a wall, if there's a, if there's a, a, a hedge, if there's a, a barrier, if there's, if there's something there that would prevent you from experiencing God in a powerful way today, you just need to ask God to rip it down. To rip it down. And so we're going to go into prayer in a couple minutes, and I, and I want to start with a, a beautiful song uh, called I See the Lord. And there's a lot of truth to this song. I see the Lord. today we give you permission to tear down the barriers tear down the walls tear down the, the hedge tear down the strongholds tear down all those things that will prevent us from experiencing you today not only in prayer but in the message from receiving your healing if we need so from, from healing you receiving your correction if need so Lord if we for receiving your love and your forgiveness and your joy if we need that Lord but just help us to, to be prepared to, to, that our soul and our heart and our mind will be fertile ground for you, Holy Spirit. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A beautiful song. And uh, was sent to me, and I... And I I had listened to it, and uh, I'm trying to learn it. I, I have to use the sticks and balls this morning instead of just the words, so you'll know, forgive me. But I believe this song will bless you as you prepare your hearts uh, for prayer today. It's called The Goodness of God. Oh. 
seek that because your goodness is following us. You want us to come. You want to bless us. You want to heal us, Lord. And we praise you for that. 
Lord, I, I don't know what's happening in people's lives, but you do. You know what pain is there. You know what the struggles are. You know what the challenges are, Lord. And I ask, Father, that you look and peer into their hearts. If they've taken those walls down, if they've taken the barriers down, if they've taken the hedges down, if they've taken the strongholds down, you can move into them in a powerful way, Lord, and bring a healing to whatever's happening in their lives. You are able, you are the God of everything that we hear and see and smell and taste and touch and experience, Lord. And we praise you for that. Father, I ask that we that, that, that you hear our prayers as we pray for those that might not have been here today, those that might be sick or under the weather, those of our extended family down in Manning, Louisiana and other places, those who are watching this on Cape Island and in other places in Newfoundland, Lord, we pray. We pray for them. That they will somehow be connected to you through our ministry here. Father, we're going to talk about something very serious. We're going to talk about shame. And we're going to talk about sentiments and feelings of, of guilt, Lord. And again, I don't know where people are. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they're dealing with. I don't know what luggage that they've carried with them from the past or what luggage they're preparing to take into the future, Lord. But if it happens to do with shame, or it happens to do with if it happens to do with the way that we feel, Lord, that we ought not to. Because you are in our lives. Help us to do away with it. Help us to listen. Help us to take on board that which you would have us understand and take that with us. And if we need a healing, Lord, let that happen today, this morning, Lord. Not when church lets out, not later on today, not tomorrow or next week, but this morning, Father, as we sit or stand in this place that we have consecrated and set aside for your purposes, Lord. And so please, speak to us, lead us, guide us, heal us, in the precious and holy name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. I talk about guilt and shame today, and how we feel about that, and how it affects us, and what it does to our lives. A little boy visiting his grandparents and his grandmother had a pet duck. A pet duck. Who has a pet duck? She had a pet duck. The grandfather gave him a slingshot, told him to go into the woods and practice. The little boy named Johnny went into the woods and he, he, he shot at everything that he thought about, but he hit nothing. He could hit nothing at all. And after an hour or so, he was despondent and he was coming back to the farmhouse and he saw the pet duck there. He thought, I'll give it one more try. I'll see if I can take the tail feathers off this duck. And he wound up and he took aim and unfortunately he killed the duck, the pet duck. He hid the body in the wood pile. As he turned to walk towards the house thinking he'd gotten away with that, Sally, his sister, was standing in the window with one of those smiles that was not really a smile. After lunch, Grandma said, Sally, could you please help me with the dishes? Sally said, oh no, Johnny's going to do the dishes today. He wants to do them for you. And then she whispered in his ear, remember the duck. The next day, they were going to go fishing. Grandpa said to Johnny, come on, we're going to go fishing. And, and Grandma said to, to Sally, no, you, you need to stay at home and help me with supper today. Oh, no, Grandma, I don't have to do that. That's already prearranged. Johnny is going to help you with supper today. And I'm going to go off with Granddad, and we're going to go fishing. And she reached in and whispered into his ear, remember the duck. Well, this went on for about two or three days. 
And then he couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't take doing his chores and her chores and, and everything else and missing out of this and missing out of that. And so he, he finally confessed to his grandmother that he had killed her pet duck. She paused and she looked at him. She reached down and she gave him a long, long hug. And then she said, I know. I too was standing at the window when you killed the duck. And I know you weren't meaning to do that. But in that moment, I forgave you. The only thing that I was wondering about is how long were you going to let your sister hold that over your head? And there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of people who hold things over our head to get us to do things that we ought not to do. In your life, have you ever been manipulated by guilt and shame? I have. I have. Have you ever been manipulated? Here's a harder question. Have you ever used guilt or shame to manipulate other people to do what you want them to do? Maybe parenthood's a good breeding ground for that kind of thing. Our bosses will use those things against us. Our children will use it against us. Our parents will use it against us. Our families will use it against us. Even pastors in some churches will use guilt and shame to get you to do some things that they want you to do. Guilt and shame are weaponized. Weaponized to control. And sometimes the church will do that as well. In one of the churches in which I was a staff pastor... They decided that they needed to raise funds for some things that they wanted to change. And they thought that they needed to have a capital campaign. In our board meeting, I, I voted against it. I said, we can just rely on, on God. And, and the pastor said to me, well, it would be like you standing at the end of a runway holding your hand up and a jumbo jet coming down thinking you're going to stop the jet. And I said, well, if God's beside me, the jet will stop. I lost. They decided to do the capital campaign to raise this money. They brought a person in that cost probably a thousand dollars at least, maybe more. Was that more, a lot more? And he was going to lead us in the capital campaign. And he said, "You have to do certain things." And I sat there while he started to talk, and it saddened my heart. He used every trick in the book to try to get people to feel guilty or ashamed of what they weren't going to do so that they would contribute to this capital campaign the money they wanted to raise. He used heartfelt emotion, logic, guilt, shame, uh, anecdotes of stories. He used whatever he could, and I was almost made a list. Of all the exhaustive list of all the places he went trying to convince us that if we did not give above our tithes and offerings to this capital campaign, that we should be ashamed of ourselves. And that perhaps God would be ashamed of us as well. The same man said that you had to have a banquet if you were going to have a capital campaign. They rented out the local fancy hotel with a conference room, which cost them thousands of dollars, I'm sure, with dinners, hoping that they would recover a lot of this stuff in the campaign. They asked me to come and sing. So I showed up, because I wasn't going to show up, and the only reason I came is because uh, my boss said, we want you to come and sing. I walked through the doors, there were round tables, the whole way around this thing, and all the tables were scattered everywhere, Mounds of Monopoly money. It, it made my heart sick to see that. Sick. We were seated in tables from A to Z. The L table was at the back. My name is William Lee. I was sitting at the back. And I was fine with that. It was, there was no discrimination, right? It was just alphabetical. Except that there was another L family that wasn't sitting in the back with me, with the other L's that were sitting with me. They were sitting in the very front in a very prestigious position. That's because they were extremely wealthy people and could donate a lot of money. That made me sick. Then they asked me to come up because I was going to leave, and he asked me to come up and sing. I started to sing, and as I looked out there, I realized nobody was listening to me. They were all chatting with each other about this capital campaign. I stopped singing, and I left the hotel and went home. The next day, I had a very heated um, 
exchange with the lead pastor about what had happened. Guilt and shame sometimes are weaponized against us, and sometimes by pastors, and it should never, or churches, or church leaders, and it should never happen, but it happens far too often. Guilt and shame. The church doesn't exist to purposely give you a feeling of guilt or shame in something that you don't contribute to or something that you don't do or when, when they're trying to accomplish something like that. The true purpose of the church is to make you disciples of Jesus Christ. The true purpose of the church is to equip you to battle against the evil forces, not only out there, but that also might be lurking in your heart. This is all done by the resurrected Jesus Christ we see here in this empty tomb. The resurrected life of Yeshua gives you power over timidity, power that wants to make you small, but power that you can fight against that. Remember the scripture says, I have not given you a spirit of timidity, but of what? Of strength and of power and of knowledge. The resurrected life of Yeshua allows us to overcome the power of doubt that people are trying to put in your minds. The church, for anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus, a follower of Yeshua, should never, never use guilt or shame to control anybody else, not only within the church, but within your family, your workplace, or anywhere else. In fact, they should be shouting from the rooftops. That if you're paralyzed by these things, that God can heal you. And so this very morning, as we look at our lives honestly, and, uh, and remember what I said about Christian integrity, right? So we're down in Arizona somewhere, 100 miles in every direction, there isn't a soul, but there's a stop sign where these two roads cross. If you know there's no one within 100 miles of you, do you stop at the stop sign? If you have this Christian integrity that we talk about, you will stop and proceed. And so we need to ask ourselves and look at ourselves this morning and ask the Holy Spirit to look into us and convict us and change us if need be with a complete honesty. This morning, this Sunday, in this place or wherever you're watching from home today, we need to confront the purpose and the power the resurrected Jesus and what that power can do for each and every one of our lives. Carrying around guilt and shame can weigh you down. Now I've got a four minute video to show you and I'll make sense of it when we finish watching it and I want you, have you plugged that in there? I want you to listen to it. This is an exchange between Scrooge and Jacob Marley. It's from my very favorite adaptation of Christmas Carol out of the 1930s with Alistair Sims. I think that is the only one that we should watch. Please have a look and a listen.
sin that we carry, the shame that we carry, that the guilt that we carry can shackle us, can prevent us from living a life abundant, can prevent us from joy and happiness. And as long as we don't deal with it, we build another shackle, another piece of the chain every day. And if we don't deal with our shame and guilt, that's what will happen. And you will withdraw from people will cause you to do things that you not want to do. You can see that, that Scrooge was just trying to explain away the shame and the guilt. Oh, a bit of undigested meat or potato or cheese or something like that. And Jacob Marley's trying to tell him exactly why he's, this is happening to him. But he didn't want to say, oh, I believe, I believe, I, I have to, he says. I need to. I don't know if he does or not. I don't know if he does or not. Dr. Barnabas Powell. His picture's here. His parish priest of St. Raphael, Nicholas, and Irene, Greek Orthodox Church in Cummings, Georgia. And this is what he says about guilt and about shame, and I want to read it to you verbatim. He says this, The two things that we are constantly battling is the reality that is also true of me, he says, that most of the time I'm too easy on myself or too hard on myself. I'm either giving myself a pass on behaviors in my own soul that I've not confronted, or I'm beating myself up saying I've done that same sin again and again, and I'm a lousy, worthless, rotten, filthy sinner. Both of those illnesses build a wall between me and my close relationship with God. Because if you are constantly ashamed, you don't want to be around a God whom you think is ashamed of you. 
there are differences between guilt and shame. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is feeling bad about something you have done. Shame is when you feel bad for who you are because you did that. Guilt is an awareness of violating a standard, whether earthly or heavenly. Guilt is internal because it involves you and you alone and no other. Shame is an awareness of fail being failure in someone else's eyes. Shame can consume us because it involves others, whether it's God, family, friends, or anyone else. When I was going to school, my brother, <coughs> who has an architecture company in Toronto and uh, makes uh, modular homes for the homeless in Hamilton and Toronto, and uh, marvelous, marvelous job, a wonderful thing he's doing. And when he went to school, uh, if he didn't get 100, he got 98, right? He went pouting to his room. He was really upset. 98, right? All through school. Never studied, never picked up a book, never cracked a book, nothing. I, on the other hand, is an upstanding citizen of the school. Was never doing anything in the parking lot illegal. I would come home with a 60. Sometimes I came home with a 60 because I didn't bother doing the work. But every now and then I'd come home with a 60 and I did the very best that I could. And I still couldn't rise above that. From that, when Isaac used to come home and he had a mark, and, and it was in the 60s or something, I'd say, did you try your very best? He said, I did. I said, that is good enough for me. If you tried your best, that's good enough for me. But it wasn't good enough for my folks. You see, they kept on telling me how I should be like my brother. Why can't I get 98? Why do I have to get 60? Why don't I have to do this? And why don't I have to do that? And that stayed month after month, year after year. And that and some other things prompted me to pack a bag and leave and go down to New York when I was 16. Caused me to come back at 17 into a recruiting center in Toronto and join the Navy and run off to the South Pacific when I was just a child, really. I felt guilty for not getting a 98. I felt shame for not getting a 98. Even though I was never going to get that, even if I studied hard. Has that happened to you? Has it happened to you? Has someone made you feel guilty? Has it changed the course of your life? What is the remedy? The guilt, the remedy for guilt is confessing the truth to God. Confessing the truth. There's a village in Africa. When the rebels came through there, one of the things they did was they took the women and they took the young girls and they would take them away. And when they had them away for a week, they would abuse them and harm them and rape them and do all kinds of unspeakable things until they were broken and shamed. And then instead of killing them, they would take them back to the village. Because they thought that guilt and that shame would just deflate the whole village. They would become a, an anchor. There, there would be no joy. They would do more damage by taking the women and, and the girls back than killing everybody. But there was one mayor in the one town that this happened to. And in this village. And, and he did something different. He got all the men together and he said, when the women come back, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate. We're going to throw a party. Get the pig out, stick it on the spit. We're having a party. And the rebels brought these ladies and brought these girls back with their heads hung low, took the ropes off them and let them go. And they turned and left knowing, thinking they'd done whatever. And all the men and the boys ran out and gave them hugs and lifted them up and were singing in joy and thanking God that they were brought back to them. And we're telling each and every one, Whatever happened to you is not your fault. You didn't want this. You didn't do this. It was done to you. And you should never feel guilty about that. You should never feel ashamed about that. We love you. You're a part of our, our, our family, part of our community. We're going to lift you up. We will say and do whatever we need to do to help you get over this. And they brought a sense of joy into these ladies 
They were feeling guilt and shame for something they had no control over. Guilt sometimes carries a deeper wound. Sometimes we need to talk to someone that can hold our trust. To, to say something to them that could hurt us in the long run if it were gone out. We need to do that. Understand this. Understand this. You are not the sum of your weaknesses or failures or sins. You are not the sum of your failures, your weaknesses, your sins. <coughs> you are the sum of God's love for you and your capacity to be an image of Jesus in the world. You are the sum of God's love for each and every one of you. We're going to uh, sing a song together right now. And uh, it's called Create Me a, a Clean Heart. We'll also have the words on the screen. And I want you to think about those women and those girls. I want you to think about yourself, school. I want you to think about work. Maybe something happened last week. Maybe there's a sense of guilt or a sense of shame. And, and, and I want you to embrace that reality. And then I want you to embrace this song. Sing these words, please. And she could do that because there weren't supposed to be any men in town. They were supposed to be all out of the front fighting the war. But David decided to stay home. And then he did something. He wanted her. And so he called her. And because he's a king, he could kill you instantly. You had to do what he said. He called Bathsheba up and essentially raped her. Oh, it says they had sex. He said he slept with her. But essentially that was rape. She didn't have a choice. If she didn't sleep with him, they'd have killed her. And then he tried to cover it up by killing Uriah, her husband. 
And that didn't really work, and so he had him put at the very front of the battle so he would be killed. He wasn't really feeling guilty about that. He wasn't really feeling that bad about that. He, he married Bathsheba. They had a child. And then Nathan came and said what he had done. And when he told him that, he started to feel that guilt and shame. And then the baby died. It was taken from them. In his shame, in his guilt, in his sorrow, he sought God, and he wrote this, Psalm 51. Here's verse 1 and 2. Be gracious or merciful to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, he writes. We all want to be forgiven. He wanted to be forgiven. We want God to let go of our sins. We want him to wash us. We want him to heal us. We want him to restore us. We want him to cleanse us. And that's what David wanted. He had that feeling of being dirty and he didn't like it. And he was calling out to God to do something about it. We continue in verses 3 and 4. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. God is justified to be angry with David. And sometimes he's justified to be angry with you and me. But David, even in that, was asking for mercy from God. Verse 5, Behold... I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. David's going to ask now God for joy, for joy. David wants God to be merciful. <coughs> he asks God, forgive me of my sin, cleanse me of my sin. Will you please give me a joy back in my life? My, my child has died. And the only way for guilt and shame whether it's in David or whether it's you or whether it's in me, to turn into joy is through the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That is that God sent his son to live and to die, to suffer, took our sins on that moment. Remember that great moment. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. As Jesus spoke that, as Yeshua spoke those words, he took your sin upon himself. Then he took that to the grave. He left it there and rose victorious to the right hand of the Father so that you might have joy in your life even when we sin. The Bible says that all sin and fall short of glory, of God's glorious standard. There is not one good, not one, except for Jesus. Not an excuse to sin. But it tells us that we can have more, that we can rise up from that. If you feel guilty for your sins, if you feel ashamed for what you've done, that's right and appropriate for you to do that. But then you need to turn to Yeshua. You need to turn to God. You can't stay there. Because if you do, every day that you stare there, like, like Jacob Marley, you will add on another link to a very long chain that will rob you of life and joy and happiness and relationships. Verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden parts you will make me no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. We sang that together just a few minutes ago. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And sustain me with a willing spirit. He asks for mercy. He asks for joy. He asks for so many other things. And then he says, if you give me my joy back, there are things that I will do. I will be a witness for you. 
I will be a witness. I will spread that joy. I will spread that forgiveness. I will do so much more than that. It will be part of my testimony. I'm not going to read the rest of that passage. David has made his point. This is our scripture passage for today. It's 1 John 1 and 9. It's a simple passage, but it says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me read it one more time. If you confess your sins to God, God is faithful and righteous to forgive you to forgive your errors, to forgive your shortcomings, to forgive your sins, and to cleanse you from all of the unrighteousness that you have taken upon yourself. Whether you've done so on purpose or whether people have heaped that upon you. We're going to sing a song together before I finish us in prayer. It's a beautiful song. It's called He Touched Me. And I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able to stand. If you can't, remain seated. That's fine. <clears throat> We're going to sing this beautiful song together. Shackled by a heavy burden. Neath a load of guilt and shame. Then what? The hand of Jesus touched me. And I'm no longer the same. And since I met the blessed Savior, since he cleansed me and made me whole again, I'll never cease to praise him as David says. And I'll shout it while eternity rolls. May this be a prayer. May this be your song today. When you leave here today, when you wake up each morning, can you say, God, if I'm burdened by anything, take that shackle away from me. Help me not to fashion another link on the chain that I might be dragging. Lord, help me. Help me. Take the burden. And made me 
joy that you want to give each and every one of us. And if there's a guiltiness, if there is a, a bruise, a, a harm within us, if, there is, if there's shame within us, Lord, we give you permission to lift that from our bodies. Take that burden from our bodies. Take that pain from our bodies. Clear our future, Lord. Lay a path for us of joy and happiness and contentment and beauty. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for each and every person here, Lord. Thank you so much. May God be with you, guide you, hold you, and love you until we're made again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful day. Don't forget, 630 Friday. Hymn sing. It'll be wonderful. And next Saturday, Joy Sunday,